So thanks again. So after, after we saw a lot about imaging and computer, we now come to the real thing, how to get the drug where we want it and in a patient who can actually use it. And that's the next talk by Dr. Fischer, Dr. Fish, I'm sorry, from Novartis Basel. Yes, thanks a lot for this kind introduction and also to the organizers to invite me for a talk. <coughs> what I would like to share with you is, is some thoughts about bio-relevant in vitro release assays for parenteral nanocarriers with specific focus on liposomes. I have little data to share, so most of my presentation will be conceptual. So wh why do we need an in vitro release test? So there are three, mainly three reasons. First of all, we can use this test for formulation screening, get the right composition of your liposomes in order to have the desired release profile. Could be um, an immediate release, <coughs> sustained release, or essentially no release if you want to make best use of the EPRF effect, for example. So if you have a very good correlation between in vitro data and in vivo, you could also use this test system for um, assessing the likelihood of success in the preclinical and clinical settings. And the third point is also very important. It's a, you can use it for quality control because release, drug release from carriers is of course a, a critical quality parameter which uh, should be assessed. You need it to um, show batch to batch consistency to show that there's no change in release during shelf life um, and that there's no change if you change your process, for example, if you do upscaling. So how should such a test look like? So it should mimic, of course, a physiological condition. Should be sim as simple as possible robust and convenient. It should allow you to screen several formulations in parallel. Of course, you need sync conditions, meaning that the drug concentration after 100% release is not more than 30% of the saturation solubility, solubility in the uh, medium you used. And you should minimize or control artifacts like drug absorption, like uh, delay in diffusion, if you use, for example, um, a dialysis approach. And you should avoid, uh, for practical reasons, cell models, they are complicated, cumbersome, you need a certain infrastructure, and there's also sometimes safety concerns in handling with living cells. So there are, in principle, two ways you can perform those tests. One very popular method is the dialysis method. There you have a donor compartment a small donor compartment, yeah, a small donor compartment where you introduce your nanocarrier, um, which is then released and it diffuses through the semi-permeable membrane in the acceptor department compartment, which is much larger, in order to assure uh, sink conditions. So there are several advantages of this kind of tests. Is it's easy. You, the drug substance, the release drug substance is already separated from the carrier. You can easily analyze it. Uh, you can measure not only in, in the acceptor side, but also in the donor side, that you have much higher concentrations and this can help you to avoid sensitivity problems. Another, problem, uh, another advantage is that you um, could select the volume of the acceptor compartment as large as you would like to have it in order to have good sync conditions. But there are also some inconveniences uh, in using dialysis approaches and they are linked to, and they're all th at the end leading to an underestimation of the release rate. First of all, due to the high concentration in the donor compartment, so there might be violation of sync conditions. Uh, and in general, in dialysis settings, you cannot steer the internal compartments. There is a lag time for the drug substance release to diffuse into the acceptor, acceptor uh, 
department under might be some abs absorption of the drug, the release drug, to the membrane, the dialysis membrane. Another more uh, practical um, problem is that if you use very expensive uh, release media, so you should not, you cannot uh, have a very large uh, volume of the acceptor compartment. So the other principal release approach is to do it, the release in the same compartment. You have a one cap approach, I call it, uh, where the drug is released. In this case, you have, however, to separate the released drug from the carrier for each sample you will take in a separate step. So the advantage of such system, you have re really no delay. You have really see the release as quickly as it is. Uh, you has, have less risk of drug absorption taking place because you have no dialysis membrane and stirring is possible and of course recommended. But also this system of course has its um, inconveniences. So, it's, so the separation of the free drug from the drug in the carrier is, is cumbersome and takes some time. During separation, release continues and so you have here a tendency to overestimate the release. And the separation strategy depends, of course, on the physicochemical properties of the drug substance, meaning it's not a one-fits-all approach for every drug substance you would like to analyze. So here I tried to depict in a simplified way the situation nanomedicine faces when it's infused intravenously. So it interacts essentially with three different compartments, with the plasma, with the cells, and with the organs. Oh, yeah, I, sorry, the green you cannot see so easily. So in the plasma, it, it, it encounters, of course, albumin and other carrier proteins. There's <coughs> complement which um, might um, interact with the lysosomes, maybe even destroy them or make them more leaky. You have some fatty compounds, you have triglycerides, uh, lipoproteins, which could serve as a solvent for, for, for your uh, lipophilic drug substance. When it comes to the cells, you have an amazingly high surface area of red blood cells in, in, your, in your body. In adults, nearly 4,000 square meters, and also a significant surface area of endothelial cells and to a lesser extent of platelets. And all these membranes, of course, serve also as, could serve as a solvent for your drug. And it could partition into these lipid bilayers. Then you have phagocytes inside the bloodstream which could just remove the, your nanoparticles from the bloodstream. On the other hand side, you have organs like kidney removing the free drug substance MPS, so the macrophages in liver and spleen, removing eventually the nanocarrier to a certain extent. You have again a lipid solvent. You have fat tissues where the lipophilic drug substance could distribute, and the phagous tissue with eventually complex, complex interactions with your nanocarrier. So, how you can mimic this complex, complex situation, in vivo situation, in an in vitro assay? So, the, the parameters in red, they are very, very difficult to, um, to imitate. But what you could do, of course, the dilution, you can imitate it by having good sink conditions. The solvents, water, pH 7.4, carrier proteins, complements, and lipids, you can imitate in a certain way. The carrier proteins, you could include albumin in your system, in your release system, or plasma serum. Complement is also contained in plasma serum. And the lipids, you could use whole blood to have the red blood cells in it, uh, or you use, make use of the lipids already present in plasma serum. There are also interesting papers showing that with an excess on unlabeled large liposomes, you can create lipid sink conditions leading to the same purpose. So here in this slide, I would like to present, however, some data of Novartis about the release, in vitro release test. Here we used a model drug with a moderate log P, very good solubility in, in PBS, 
and high membrane permeability as expressed by an, um, uh, Pampa data. So this is a typical compound optimized for oral drug delivery, meaning high membrane permeability, high bioavailability. This model drug is incorporated in the axis core of liposomes, of cells, gel state liposomes. The release test is a, is a one cap approach and solid phase extraction was used to separate the drug from the carrier. On the left hand side here you see the, the PK data in mice. You see this specific drug substance is very quickly um, removed from the carrier and this disappears from the bloodstream. And on the left hand side, so we try to mimic this with three different kinds of release media. And I have to um, stress that under all these conditions you have massive uh, sync conditions. But what's amazing that with PBS and PBS plus albumin you get really not the same release as in vivo, whereas the serum, the mouse serum, sh seems to match better to this. So what can you conclude out of those data? Not too much, of course, because it's a very isolated data set, not representative. But the point I wanted to make in my presentation that <coughs> when it comes to a um, released assay, uh, it's no, not only important to think about the methodology and, and assure sync conditions, but um, that an appropriate release medium is also very important. And I would really uh, advise to, to stick to nature, be as close as possible uh, to physiology to avoid any kind of, of, of artifacts. And of course, at the end, it would be great to have a companion method standardizing release tests also for parenteral nanomedicine. This would uh, reduce the regulatory risk, of course. But due to the complex situation in vivo, it's probably still a long way to go. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. is in plasma stability in the site of action, let's say tumor, I mean, it's very different question, and the system should be very, very different. Not plasma is very different to what you have in the tumor microenvironment or in inflammation site, so I think it's not, it's a much more complicated. You really oversimplified it quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, by purpose, because it's already complicated enough, so it's only for IV. Um, uh, injection, what's taking place in the bloodstream. You're completely right, and that's why it will be very difficult to, to come to a standardized system. But you should always, as you pointed out, always uh, stick to the, to the question you're interested in. Here in this case, first, the uh, first place, so if you want to look for EPR effect, of course, you want to have a long circulation half-life, not only of your nanocarrier, but also of your drug inside. And for this question, such a release as it might be relevant. But then, I mean, okay, you know, you may miss all your points completely because you get very good stability in the plasma. If it's stable in the tumor, then you have nothing. That's right also, huh? But this is already the first step, huh? I can agree with you for the point, uh, for, for the purposes of determining quality control, whether one batch is similar to another, that it would be useful to have an in vivo release assay like you're talking about. But for actually determining clinical utility, I agree with Hesse that this, this is in no way going to be able to help you determine that because depending on the mechanism of action of the drug, whether, say, in cancer it's a schedule-dependent or schedule-independent drug, you have a completely different optimum release rate for every different drug and for every different disease and for every different tumor, and that it's absolutely not predictable from any kind of an in vivo assay. So you, uh, ultimately what's important is the amount of bioavailable drug at the site of disease. It's very difficult to measure that, and it absolutely cannot be predicted other than by doing the actual, doing actual in vivo 
kinds of release experiments. Yeah, I totally agree with your remarks. Thank you very much.